Chapter 15, The Decoy. You do not agree with my quest, I understand that, so much as it is possible to understand someone with whom I disagree so completely. We open with Adeline's POV, as he is extremely excited about all of the jumping around that he just saw his dad Dalinar do in the previous Dalinar chapter. Going up the Sonic CD rock and all of that, well, that's exactly the sort of thing he's been hoping his dad will get back into. That's the Blackthorn he remembers. And then we find out something really weird. Dalinar has had his memory wiped of Adeline's mother. And I don't just mean the memories have been, like, taken away. No, he's had it, like, a thing put on him so that he can't learn anything about her. He's got memories sh that she should be in, but she's not in them. Anytime he hears her name, it's just whoop out of his brain again. He just can't find out anything about who she was. He's just not capable, and this is told to us in a very scant and tantalising way, and then just moved on from. We learn that Vamar, a high prince, who was mentioned just sort of in passing, but who we know nothing about just yet, has been invited on this particular hunt, because Dalinar and Sadeus have some sort of secret reason to want him to be there. Now, those two guys are enemies, but people have levels and nuances, and they'll work together if there's something they both need to achieve, protecting the king in this particular case. And in a bit of verbal sparring between Dalinar and Sadeus, we learn that the bridgemen are owned by Sadeus. Dalinar doesn't have bridgemen. He needs to get his armies over the chasms, and he has bridges, but they've got wheels on them. Bridges with wheels, you can just stick them on the back of a chol or something, have them drag them along. It's easy, you don't need bridge crew at all. But it's slower. The king's into speed, you know? There's a lot at stake when you're in this big war where you have to get to places first. But Dalinar's going, well, yeah, all right, but what victory really is there if it comes at the cost of all the lives of these, if you have to have slaves? And we learn that Sadeus explicitly uses the bridgemen as cannon fodder. He sends them in to draw the fire from the uh, Pashendi's archers in the hope that they'll be distracted from the actual soldiers and maybe, you know, even use up all their arrows on the bridgemen, thinking that they're important and hoping that maybe they can, you know, drop the bridges before they're put down, but, you, but it doesn't matter because they're expendable to Sadeus. And so that's the plan. It's not just, it's not just by the by, they're not just dying as an unfortunate consequence of the war they're in. Like, their purpose is to die. It's the whole point of the tactic of using manned bridges at all. Now, do you remember that in the prologue, when the king, Gavilar, was murdered, he was murdered by Zeth, with the big eyes and the white hood, and he left a final message. And the message was, find the most important words a man can say. Well, here we learn that Dalinar got that message, but also that it is a quote from something called The Way of Kings! Which is a big book, presumably the source of all the rules and codes and so on that Dalinar is such a stickler for, and which, we are informed, would be dead against the kind of behaviour that Sadeus is coming up with. Sadeus, if you don't remember, he's the Robotnik one. Red armour, Robotnik head, owns the bridgemen, is horrible. And today he's horrible because he's insulting Dalinar's sons. Adeline nearly kicks off about that, but Dalinar's all wise, 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 wise. And Adeline's all firebrand, firebrand! Wise, 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 firebrand! Wise. And Sadeus is all villain, 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 firebrand! Villain, wise. Villain, villain, villain. Wise, wise, firebrand, villain, wise, firebrand, wise, firebrand, wise, villain, wise. And the king's loving this because the whole thing that they do in their society is they let their high princes compete like this for power and influence and stuff. It's just the done thing. But Dalinar's new ideas about uniting everyone, because remember that voice in his head in the visions that he gets when a high storm comes saying, unite them. Remember that? can't unite them if you're competing with them. And then who comes trotting in but Wit, a character with whom something is a bit off. And it says in my notes here that it is reiterated that there's something off about him. I don't know when it was originally iterated, which makes me think that he appeared in a previous chapter and I just didn't notice. And so I haven't mentioned him before in the video. So, so tell me in the comments when Wit first appeared, because I've gone and Googled it and I can't find anything out because everyone's too busy banging on about Cosmere lore, but at least we know what isn't off about him, and that's that he isn't on Sadeus's side, because Sadeus is ready to kill him for one of his comments. Bit of a court jester character, the Wit. It seems to be a sort of a job, you can, I don't know if it's a job that all kings have in this world, or if just this one met this one guy and made him the Wit. Um, but he basically comes in and instead of telling jokes and tumbling like a jester, he says incredibly witty things, and they're a bit sarcastic and wry, and droll, and everyone goes, ha 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 ha, ha ha, they go, ha ha, did you notice there was a bit of punctuation there, ha ha, comma, end quotes, they go, comma, quotes, ha ha, proper punctuation, it's important. Now Dalinar's got a bit of a private matter, trying to lean on a shelf there, but there isn't anywhere for me to lean. Now, Dalinar's got a bit of a private matter to deal with. What am I leaning on? Hamilton. Dalinar's got a matter to deal with that Elokar has set him to do. He's going to go and investigate that strap thingy. 
the was it called the girdle that snapped on the uh, on the king's uh, horse chair on his saddle. That's, yeah, the saddle girth, that's what it's called. Well, Dalinar and Adeline go off to investigate that, because did it snap? Or was it cut? Remember, the king's always paranoid about everything, so he's wondering if it was sabotage. Now, if it was an assassination attempt, it wouldn't be a very good one, because falling off a horse isn't really going to do anything to you when you're in shard plate, which the king obviously was, and generally everyone likes him anyway. There's nobody who would want to assassinate this king, because he doesn't do anything, to, he doesn't really call on them to do anything. All the high princes get to just go around hunting gem hearts and stuff, and it's nice, and they have a good time. They're not really progressing the war effort in any meaningful way, but they're all having a good old gung-ho sort of time. But it does kind of look like it's been cut, and Adeline will not stop assuming that it was Sadeus who's behind it, because obviously he's Dr. Robotnik, and just a minute ago, he was just a minute ago going, villain, villain, villain. Just a second ago, we all heard him. Villain, villain, villain. Then you get a bit where, despite visibly loathing each other, to Adeline's eyes at least, Dalinar and Sadeus jointly manipulate another high prince, and you get the sense that they're doing the sort of maintenance and politics stuff that keeps everything running, while the king is just preoccupied with his own paranoia, really, about assassination attempts and getting gem hearts. And then we learn a bit about their disagreement. Agreement. It turns out that Sadeus thinks that the reason the king is so paranoid is because Dalinar coddles him so much. And Dalinar is annoyed that Sadeus was off partying somewhere when his brother, the then king, was murdered. But then we find out in private conversation with Adeline that so was he. He was flat out drunk on the ground, against the codes which his brother had tried to instill in him. So now he obsessively follows them. Now we know, because we were watching in the prologue, how Gavilar's last words to Dalinar got on the ground. But Dalinar assumes that Gavilar just wrote them on the ground, and that's a shameful thing. Men don't write. He believes that Gavilar could write, and kept it as a shameful secret. But before he was drunk, Gavilar's last words to him, face to face, were, follow the codes tonight. All of which adds up to mean that he's going to follow the codes pretty much forever. And we learn that Dalinar and Gavilar were best friends with Sadeus before the king was murdered, and it was actually Sadeus' idea that night to throw on the king's stuff and basically act as a decoy. Just remember, there was a decoy king for the assassin to go after, and that was Sadeus. I mean, he, it was suicide. He was going to be assassinated in the king's stead. The assassin just happened not to fall for it. But it's not enough for, for Dalinar. He's never forgiven Sadeus for running away, for getting away, instead of staying there to fight and prevent the king's murder. Meanwhile, Sadeus hasn't forgiven him for being drunk somewhere else. And despite all of this, they swore that they would at least keep Gavilar's son safe. And that's what all of this is about. And that's why, despite, you know, hating each other, they will work together to protect the king at all costs. Which is an interesting story, and it's something which, in another book, might have been the story. It might have taken ages to resolve. But no, it, it's all covered in this one chapter. So they tell Elokar that there is every chance that his saddle girth was, in fact, tampered with. And there's a moment where Elokar is so paranoid that he thinks that it might have been one of Dalinar's men. Might have been Dalinar, might have been Adeline, who actually cut it. And then we find out what the Way of Kings is. It's what the Lost Radiance followed. Which makes it controversial, doesn't it? Because the Radiance, they used to be saviors of the people type people. That's how they were when we saw them in the prelude. But now, in the present, they're the lost Radiance, right? And everyone thinks of them as traitors. So the code that they follow... Now, I don't know if it's the same code as we were talking about a minute ago. The codes. Follow the codes tonight. I don't actually... I'm a little bit hazy on whether that is the same thing as what's written in the Way of Kings. So please tell me in the comments, because I was hazy about that all the way through the book. And frankly, it sort of hampered my enjoyment of those bits. I was always a bit confused about that. So do let me know. So in this chapter, we find out that the current tactic in the war against the Parshendi is actually Dalinar's idea, which is to use siege tactics against the enemy. That's as opposed to attacking. Now, I don't personally know what the difference is. I thought that siege tactics is when you use big wooden structures to like pour into enemy buildings, like in Settlers 6 or that bit in Lord of the Rings. Um, but in this what they're doing is they're basically boxing the Pushendi into like one bit at the far end of the plains where they can't get out. But it isn't working. They thought that by keeping them confined to that one area the Pushendi would just run out of food or whatever, but it seems like they've packed for a long trip. And then there's the gem hearts. The war seems to currently consist of people sitting around in big towers looking out for great shells, and when they spot one everybody pours in to try and harvest the gem heart. And the Alethi and the Parshendi armies fight each other for control of the plateau that it happens to be on and things get nasty. But it's also a race among the high princes. Whoever gets there first, there to the plateau, their army is who gets to fight the Parshendi. This is my this is my fighting gesture apparently. Fighty, 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 fight, and get the gem heart. But up until then, the high princes are basically in competition, so it kind of injects a certain sporting element to the whole thing. Now the Parshendi have never actually explained why they had the king assassinated, despite being asked. Dalinar seems to be the only person left anywhere, including the king's son, the king, who actually wants to know why. We get a couple of spread in this chapter, 
character that we haven't seen before. Anger spren are like small pools of bubbling blood on the ground. And then there's an unknown sort of spren that Brandon doesn't name for us today. When a great shell is killed, tiny, almost invisible tongues of smoke, such as might come from a snuffed out candle, come off them, and nobody knows what those are. Ooh. Death Spren. While we're on the lore mentioned in this chapter, there's a kind of Fabriel mention that hasn't been mentioned before. Heater Fabrials, which are rubies on poles with worked golden tines, which is the name for like the prongs on a fork holding them in place. And Soul Casters, uh, their abilities are capped by the strength of the gems that they use in their soul casting Fabrials. A gem heart, therefore, can create nearly anything without shattering. Now, I was when I was reading this, I was picturing the gem hearts as being like a, a kind of a uh, an internal organ that these creatures have that's full of really good gems, but based on that note, perhaps I read it wrong and they're just one big gem. Anyway, we get an important note about Adeline in this chapter, which is that he's got a bit of blonde in his hair. The people in this book tend to have dark hair, but with bits of blonde mixed in if they're Alethi, and the blonde comes from his mother. Now, we don't know anything about his mother apart from that, do we? We get an interesting note about great shells in this chapter that may help us out later. You don't normally harvest their gem hearts in the way that those guys just did, you know, with a big battle. Usually you wait for them to appear on the western side of the plains where the plateaus are wider, where they make these rocky chrysalises for themselves to hide in, and they, and they wait for high storms. Now, at this point, we don't know what they gain by being out in high storms, but if they've got gem hearts, then you know, the implication there is that the, in the same way that the high storms infuse gems with magic, these guys, the, the, the great shells, get infused with magic in their hearts when the high storm passes by. So yeah, you would want to be out in that, wouldn't you? I guess that's why they're so big and crusty and heavy. It's, so, it's you know, that's evolved so that they can stay clamped onto the rocks during a high storm. So the thing is, several times a week you'll see one do this. So you just wait for it to hibernate inside its chrysalis and then just hack away at it. Fighty, fighty, fighty. We learn that shard plate heals itself when damaged, even if it's been completely shattered. Cool. And that's the end of chapter 15. That one took a while to talk about.